So good morning, everyone. So today I'm going to, uh, to talk about uh, how to uh, deliver information from medical images to uh, end users. And uh, so this is going to be about image analysis. So this talk is not going to be about, uh, about uh, uh, image processing uh, that we do. So it's not about us. <coughs> we all use uh, FSL, SPM, Free Software, and your favorite uh, softwares. What, uh, what I'm going to focus this talk on is uh, how to deliver uh, those image analysis methods to, uh, to end user who are uh, clinicians and neuroscientists, and for which uh, image analysis is very, uh, very much uh, a black box. They, there is, uh, we, we do some magic with software, and what they, what they really want is uh, uh, to get their results so that they can publish their, their findings. So we, uh, we thought uh, very hard on that, and we had multiple iteration. And uh, we ended up looking at uh, what kind of users we wanted to address. And uh, as, a, as a general categorization, we um, describe when users are either our radiologists uh, or uh, clinical trial teams, so often uh, CROs or medical researchers. And again, those medical researchers are those who a minimum uh, background in the image processing and image analytics. And usually they use, uh, you see on the, on the left, I've put the three uh, main sources of software for image analysis that those uh, three segments are using. So either the scanners themselves comes with uh, image processing, so this is more and more the case. Uh, can buy uh, commercial software, or there are plenty of uh, 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 research software which are available, which are uh, many are free or open source. Uh, I made the distinction here with this uh, horizontal line that uh, the, the research software are for, very often are for research only, and there is quite a, a barrier to, uh, to use for, uh, for medical because of the requirement to get a regulatory approval for using in a clinical setup. So the solution that we have uh, worked on in the past several years is a cloud delivery approach. And uh, so on the, on the left, I put this, uh, this box representing basically a cloud service. So we have those uh, uh, image processing algorithm running somewhere on a server, and uh, they can be interrogated. So either, uh, so the top arrow is uh, through a web interface, so the end user can just upload their images on, and get the results, uh, and download the results. Uh, but by using an API, uh, we think we can also interface the three main channels of delivery for those methods. So the scanners could, uh, could actually uh, send us the images and we could process them. Uh, we are talking to a few uh, commercial software manufacturers, uh, vendors, and uh, some research softwares can also uh, link to, uh, through our API to our cloud computing servers. So I'm going to, uh, to, uh, to show an one example of, uh, of such, a, uh, such a tool. And the example I picked is the, uh, it's a PET processing. So at the moment we have uh, MRI PET, on MRI we have an atrophy report and soon a flare report. But uh, this talk is going to be about uh, PET imaging. So one of the markers that have been uh, uh, rising recently, it's uh, amyloid marker. So most of you know that uh, uh, in, in Alzheimer's disease is associated with the deposition of amyloid plaque of the brain. Uh, in 2006, there was this uh, new marker that came in, the Pittsburgh compound B, which binds to, this, uh, to those amyloid plaques. And the, the, the redder, the more radioactivity, the more concentration of amyloid in the brain. So then the problem is to quantify those scans and to use uh, methods to, uh, to provide the scientists and the clinicians with, uh, with numbers they can, uh, they can use for the study. So the first step that uh, pretty much everyone is doing, you have your MRI, you have your PET, you align the two together. Uh, once they are aligned, uh, that allows you to uh, uh, define uh, an area in the, in the brain. In the, in the case of uh, the compound P, the compound B, it's the cerebellum cortex, so the white area. So you, you somehow you, 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 you segment this area, you take the average, you normalize the image by this average. Then from the MRI, you have your gray matter, you pass it at your brain into areas, and then you can compute the average on those uh, specific areas. And, and then from then on, you can uh, do your, your science uh, with an estimate of amyloid deposition in the brain. 
So the objectives of all uh, of our study for this particular project was to uh, to develop a, a similar technique, but without the need of uh, of uh, MRI. And the normalization area that I show, which is the cerebral cortex, depends be between uh, traces. So we wanted also to have something robust to that. Uh, so the, the tool that we developed is, uh, it uh, can be found in this, on this uh, URL, mixcloud.cso.au. And one of the very popular softwares uh, around for analyzing uh, uh, PET images has been uh, Neurostat. So this has been around for many years. Uh, it's been developed by uh, Professor Minoshima in, uh, in Japan. Now he's, uh, he's working in the US. But basically what does this thing is doing is uh, take the surface of the brain Rough, uh, rough, uh, convex all of the of the brain. Take, uh, then you take uh, a perpendicular to the surface and take the maximum or an average of the first uh, the first pixels going uh, inward to the brain. And this has been developed for FDG, so that's a glucose uh, a glucose marker. And this works very well because FDG most of the signal is in the gray matter and there is almost no signal in the white matter. So if you take a, a perpendicular to the surface and you take the maximum as you go inward, uh, you can project on that surface the, the signal, and this is what you see here. By using a database of uh, normal, uh, normal subjects, one can compute a z-score. So this is what it's reported. So basically, we try to do something similar, but for other markers. So in the case of uh, amyloid, so PET-PIB uh, uh, surface projection, so that's using the MRI. So this shows basically taking the surface of the white matter. Uh, for each point on, the white ma on, the, on that surface, take the, the, the average of the gray matter, which is the closest, and then uh, painting the surface with a color code that represents either the, the, the actual SUVR value or the Z-score coming from your database of normal. Uh, so this works very well with MRI. When you don't have MRI, so this is the, the method that I'm going to be briefly describing. So the tools work uh, by uploading a new scan to this, uh, to this website. Then there is a special normalization which is happening. So the, the, the scan is registered to an atlas. Uh, there is a surface projection that computes the local PET signal. And then a report is generated. And that report is sent by email. So quickly, if I go through the uh, various steps, the first problem is that your PET scan has a, has a different appearance whether the subject has a negative scan or a positive scan, which is not the, the, the case on, uh, in MRI. So we have, uh, we have had to create an atlas which varies from uh, healthy to Alzheimer's, basically. And uh, the, when you get your new subjects, you have to uh, optimize these uh, this, uh, parameters that select the atlas that is the, the closest to the, to the subjects. So this was uh, one step that needed to be done. As I mentioned, various stresses require uh, different uh, normalization area. So though this is the list of the stressors that are currently, uh, uh, that, that can be used in our system. So there are five, I think, amyloid tracers. There is FDG. Uh, we have a new tau tracer that are also uh, working, but are not shown here. But it shows, uh, uh, so from the left, the normalization is the cerebellar cortex. In the middle is the whole cerebellum, and that's more relevant for floor beta pair. And the right shows that the, the pulse is the, the, the uh, recommended uh, normalization area for flutometamol. So that's the GE compound for amyloid. So this is the, 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 the tricky part of the method when you don't have uh, an MRI. Uh, so it goes, so from the, uh, if I read the slide from the, from the left, so you get your, uh, your PET scan, you, no, you have normalized it to your, to your template, which, has been, which is adaptative. And then, because you have done that, you have also a database of, uh, of pair of MRI and PET that you have already characterized. So at the moment, we've, we use 20. We found that this works uh, remarkably well. For each one of those 20, you have a, a, a surface representation that has been simplified. 
so that's why the, the surface here shown is, uh, is rather smooth. It doesn't include all the foldings of uh, all the subjects. And basically what it does, uh, it, it shows, for example, on the, on the right uh, brain surface, this red box. Um, what we do, we look at the, the same red box on the 20 subjects and uh, we compute a weight which is uh, related to uh, um, uh, mutual information, localized mutual information, and basically we weight for each location on the surface those from the, those templates which are the, 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 the most similar to that particular subject. Uh, so this is a bit involved. Uh, if you want more details, I can, I can explain, but it seems to work pretty well, so that shows uh, uh, those two lines show, uh, uh, for example, on one subject, the top is the method. So lo looking at the pet, if you don't have the MRI, and this, is, this uh, displays on the surface the, the pet signal, and uh, the, the, the line on the bottom is the same processing if you have the MRI and you know where is your gray matter and your white matter. And uh, uh, so you can see that the result is, uh, is quite similar. There are some differences. The table uh, emphasize, uh, shows that uh, there is a, the absolute error between those two uh, methods is about uh, four to five percent, uh, which is within the noise of the of the of the PET signal. So this this is for flutometamol, so the G compound, but it's, uh, it it works uh, for it's about the same for all the compound. So basically, we can get similar results without an MRI. Uh, uh, to uh, identify where is the gray matter. Uh, so we, we tried that on many subjects, and the first thing that all uh, clinicians did is to throw at it a very difficult case. So uh, we got a lot of uh, cookie points with them here because uh, it worked on that particular case. So this is probably the worst case that they had in the ABLE uh, study. So the, the, the subject, you can see the, on the top left, the three images, the, the head was very tilted. And uh, we, we, we managed to register it properly to the template on, on computer uh, decent signal uh, from that. So as I said, it works for various stresses. So this is the piece by compound B on the top for uh, amyloid positive uh, subjects. So those would be classified as uh, Alzheimer. The Navidia compound, the second line, uh, fl fl floor beta so that's the AV45, fluorbetapen, flutometamol on the, on the bottom. And uh, they, they gave pretty much all uh, the same signal. Uh, so this is in SUVR. There is also a method to normalize the units between the various stresses so that you can compare uh, subjects together who have had a different uh, marker. Uh, it's very useful to detect and to uh, look at uh, evolution of the, of the signal over time. Uh, so the first line is uh, at baseline. So in that case, the subject was uh, MCI and it had a bit of uh, amyloid deposition. And you can see that the middle line at uh, 12 months and the bottom line uh, 24 months later, uh, you can clearly see an increase in the, the signal and the, uh, which shows as a more, uh, a more red here with these characteristic patterns that of uh, Alzheimer's uh, amyloid deposition. Uh, it works also for FDG PET, so that's quite useful. Uh, it, it shows, for example, uh, it's very useful for differential diagnosis. So the top is a typical Alzheimer's disease pattern. The, the bottom is what you would uh, expect from uh, subjects suffering from dementia with a Lewy body, DLB. Uh, cortico basal syndrome on the bottom has, uh, is yet a different uh, pattern which is uh, mostly negative for amyloid. So clinicians are, are give us some different pathologies. So you have uh, four different pathologies here with very typical uh, pattern of amyloid deposition. Uh, actually, uh, yes. So the behavioral FTD, progressive non-fluent aphasia, so affecting the, the language area. Semantic dementia, uh, logopenic aph aphasia. So it's, it's very useful to have a very quick read on the scan and to identify those different uh, pathologies. Uh, so as I mentioned, there is also a similar tool for, for brain atrophy. So that computes the cortical thickness. And, and it so that slide shows that the, 
for example, the top line is one subject uh, FDG, so that's related to a glucose metabolism, which matches very well the atrophy that can be computed from MRI. And similar for the, the bottom, uh, semantic dementia, where the, the same area is affected. Another, another, uh, an that's another uh, result showing the progression of atrophy be uh, between 18 months. So you, you can see the signal increasing. Uh, so what we what we uh, hope to do is use those kind of tools to uh, to provide a, a spectrum of biomarkers, imaging biomarkers to uh, to uh, clinicians and to uh, researchers, and uh, working with uh, with a group in France uh, led by Gaël. Uh, by having in the same framework multiple signals, so in that case I put uh, gray matter in the middle, it's uh, FDG glucose metabolism on the right, the amyloid plaques, uh, different areas combined together can uh, provide a, a, a more specific uh, uh, response to a, a more specific characterization of uh, pathology, in that case Alzheimer's. So that's a new, uh, new results using the new uh, tau uh, tracers that uh, Chris Radiostin is, uh, is uh, trying. So basically the tool comes like that. Uh, there is a website you can select from your computer uh, one or more uh, PET scans. Uh, you have to select which tracer it is. And, and then the, the, it's free access once you have registered, and then you can, uh, you can upload up to two gigabytes of uh, data sets, and then it runs. And at the moment, we are using uh, 10 nodes running in parallel, and uh, we can process, I think, about 25 or 30 scans per hour. Uh, the results are sent by email, and uh, basically that's what you get once the process is, uh, is done. You get uh, one PDF. Uh, page uh, report per subject. So this is the recto and verso of that page. So the, uh, the recto uh, shows the, the main display of uh, the signal over the surface of the brain. This is normalized. You have some numbers here which, uh, which, are, uh, which is a quantitative signal on various parts of the brain, various slopes, and uh, some basic information for helping the, the doctor to make a decision. On the back, there are these scores maps with various normalizations. So this one is the uh, cerebellar cortex normalization, the whole cortex, and the pons normalization. On top of that, uh, we provide also a, a basically a CSV uh, file with the, the signal for different parts of the brain. So if you have 100 uh, scans, uh, if you have uploaded 100 scans, you would have 100 lines with uh, as many columns as uh, areas. Uh, there is an extra report for quality control, where you can check if the registration has been done properly, if the area has been, uh, has been correctly identified, and, uh, and you can download, if you wish, all the data sets, all the actual pets which have been registered into the MNI space. Um, then also for each, uh, each uh, subject, we can create a web report, so you can go online and check the various images and graphs for that, for that subjects. Uh, so I think uh, that's it. So to conclude, I uh, hope I'd convince you that uh, we managed to do a pretty robust tool to quantify uh, PET uh, scans, and it works for the most of the amyloid tracers, FDG, and soon for some of the tau tracers. Uh, it with similar performances between the carbon-11 and F18 compounds. And uh, it's, so it's, it's, really, uh, it's really easy to, uh, to access. And so at the moment, it's an evaluation version, and we would be very happy to get uh, much feedback. So to finish, I'd like to thank all the, the people involved. So there are many people involved from the ABLE studies, and uh, including the participants in the studies. And, uh, and those are the people in the at CSO who are really uh, uh, spend a lot of time and effort to, uh, to develop this, uh, this tool. So thank you very much for your attention. OK, just while we're switching over to projectors, we've got time for one question.
baffled to win science, Olivia. Okay, well, we might keep moving. So our next speaker